You know, church, and I believe this with all of my heart, church on Sunday should be a place that we come, the wounded come, and we have our wounds healed, put salve on, but we also get that boost of energy to go back out, to go back out into the world and be the light to those. Amen? This is the place where we regroup. This is the place where all those distractions of the world going on around us, even in our community, all those distractions that are just nagging, you know, that are in the conversation of everybody's conversation. It's just, this is where we focus on the Lord. He's our healer. He's going to heal our hearts. He's going to heal those wounds. Amen. If that's what we have our eyes on, is what's going on in a community. You know what? What's going on in the world? Israel's being bombed right now by Iran. And our world is, if we sit there and look at all the things that's going on in our world, we're going to be very, very anxious. But I'm here to give you hope today. Because we have a hope that we can be insulated from all those things. Yes, those things can be going on around us, but it's just like a blizzard going on and you're driving in your car with the heater going. It doesn't affect you because you can just go right on through in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, the last time that I shared, we, I visited. Thank you, Jesus, for anointing my tongue. Amen? <laughs> Do you guys ever get tongue-tied? Um, we, we just came off of Easter and we talked about how salvation is free. Grace is free. Did you know that? That's the good news. Your debt has been paid. And there's a lot of controversy around that because you've got the people that have been in, been following Jesus all their life, and they get upset. When you start telling someone who's a sinner, and everybody knows they're a sinner, that they can be saved, and, and they're, it's free. Because we all look on the outside sometimes and we say, but you have to change. But you have to change. But they're not. But they're not. Listen, salvation is free. If you could earn it, if you could be good enough, why did Jesus have to die? And we just came out of Easter where we heard the good news that the father sent his only son, who was a spotless lamb, to be that lamb for us, that we didn't have to sacrifice every year for the blood to cover us for a year. The blood didn't cover us anymore. Jesus' blood washed it. And it's free. It is absolutely free. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Guess what? You get to go to heaven because of Jesus. All you have to do is receive him and accept him. That's not popular among the, the religious people, the Pharisees of the day, because, because they, want, they, they like those works. So I really need you to hear me today because this is part two. Salvation is free. But being a disciple cost you everything. See, being a disciple of Jesus, I like to call it a Christ follower. You know, some people think they're a Christian today just because they were born in America. You're a Christian, that literally means you're a Christ follower. You're going to follow him. So let's, let's see what a Christ follower does. Let's go ahead and look up Matthew 16, 24 in the TPT. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own, as you continually surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your life, lives for my glory, you will continue to dis discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will forfeit what you're even trying to keep. 
So see, the last time I shared about salvation, and it is a glorious gift. But when we receive that gift, we don't all of a sudden have to do works. Our response is love. The problem is, on the outside looking in, it kind of looks the same. Um, I'm not going to be crash, but you can understand this. A prostitute and a wife perform the same acts, but one does it for a totally different reason. So when you accept that free gift, you're either going to be a prostitute or you're going to be a wife. You're going to do it out of love. You're going to deny yourself. See, I brought a throne up. This is the best throne we could get. You like this little throne? It's kind of comfortable, except I'm short. Now, this is how we all are. We're used to ruling our own lives. We've ruled our own lives as long as we've lived. And then we hear a message from Easter about how Jesus paid our price. And we do. We get convicted. And we say, okay, Lord, I want you. And I accept that sacrifice. But you know what we do? Instead... We say, okay, Lord, here's your throne. Here's your throne. You can rule. You can be my savior. But I really, really liked ruling my life because this is what we do. This is what the devil came in the garden to steal. The authority. But we've been so used to it but now we've let Jesus be our Savior. Oh, I'm going to heaven. Yay. But let me tell you what this self-life does. Now, that doesn't, I'm living, I'm ruling myself. It doesn't mean I'm not going to heaven. Not saved, not have a, I have a white robe. I'm going to heaven. I just don't have a clue. This self-life with me ruling, I mean, think about it. You're going to, during this uh, sermon, you're going to think, wow. I want you to analyze what you're ruling your life. Is it really working? Because you know what happens when you rule your own life? You focus on all the problems around you. Everything going on, your marriage, your finances, the news, the world, your business, your kids, everything that's a mess. The church, the people aren't perfect. She didn't smile at me today or wave, the sound's not good, I can't hear anything, the bathrooms, they're not decorated like I like them, one of them's probably stopped up, they didn't invite me to potluck, I mean, guess what, I can just, it's endless, the more I think about it, the more, and I'm sitting here ruling my life, so you're going to have to decide who's on your throne, you know, we got a lot of little thrones. And it's going to take the rest of your life to decide who's, gonna, who's sitting on it. Because a lot of times we say, okay, you know, he's Lord. He is, he's going to be Lord. You know, surrender, we talked, Nate, in the sermon, talked about surrender. Surrender, broken down, literally means to give over. Sir means over. Render means to give over. I'm going to surrender. What are you surrendering? Well, when you got saved, you got a free gift and you surrendered your eternal salvation. Once you did that, then the war has started. The war has started because you're going to have to choose now who are you going to let sit on that throne because there is someone who's a very capable ruler that loves you so much, that wants to sit on that throne. But I have to get out of that chair for someone else to sit in it. The problem is, is I just get out for a second, and then I run back in and get in it. I need to get out of it and stay out of it 
Amen? So I, I mentioned that um, discipleship costs you everything. And it will. It'll cost you your dignity. You know, David danced before the Lord and he said, I'm going to get more undignified than this. You know, it, it, it costs you your pride. It costs you your pride to be able to say you go to church on Sunday morning. It costs you your pride to surrender. You know what? It costs blind Bartimaeus in the Bible. Jesus was walking by. Then he whispered, Jesus, Jesus, I'm over here. Jesus, Jesus. Come help me, I'm blind. No, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't care who was, he, he surrendered his pride. You know what? He surrendered his pride to get something. Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. They tried to keep him quiet. They tried to keep him quiet, but no. He said, no, I want what Jesus has. And he got healed because he laid down his pride. Surrender is giving up your control, giving up your rulership of your life taking your hands off and saying, Lord, you can rule better than me. Let me just tell you, we're going to read in Galatians chapter 5. And it'll be a little bit long, but it's so good. Because we've heard a lot about what... There's a battle between... We, you, you've all heard, if you've been in the Christian community... At any time, you hear people talking about your flesh. Well, that's just your flesh. Well, if you think about it, people that have never heard of that are like, what? What's the flesh? Well, the flesh just me means your self-life. Yourself. You're so used to ruling yourself. So your self-life. So let's start Galatians uh, 5, verse 16. He says, let me emphasize this. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit... You will abandon the cravings of your self-life. So there you have it. You have a battle between your self-life and yielding to the Holy Spirit's rule in your life. When your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit, then you hinder him from living free within you. You wonder why some people walk in victory and you don't? Well, it may be that there's some self-life in you that is hindering the Holy Spirit living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings, did you know that? When you have the Holy Spirit, his intense cravings inside you will actually hinder your self-life from dominating you. If you want to walk free from those things that hinder you, Invite the Holy Spirit to walk more and more in you. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh is what the King James says. Or Amplified or another version. I don't know which one. So then the two, this is it. This is the key. So then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are this. Your self-life of the flesh and the new creation of the Spirit. So there you have it. You've given your life to Jesus. You've said, I accept your sacrifice. Now, boom, you have a war. You're going to either continue on your self-life or you're going to continue in the Holy Spirit. And the one that you yield to the most is the one you're going to follow after. So let's go ahead and read 18. But when you yield to the life of the Spirit, you will no longer be living under the law. We talked about the law last time. You'll be soaring over it. You don't have to worry about the law when you just follow after the Spirit. You actually complete the law. If you could get saved by the law or follow Jesus by the law, why did he come? There was no reason for it. You can't do it. You need the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the behavior of the self-life. 
19, the behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, not immortality. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious, no amens, being envious of, because someone might think, (laughs) being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and other similar behaviors. Those are the works of your self-life. Those are, the, those are the fruits of you ruling your own self. I don't think I want those fruits in my life. But it just said, if I walk after the Spirit, I won't do those things. Now, I don't know about you, but out of a congregation here, I don't know the percentage, 75% of statistics are made on the spot anyway, but I do know it's very, very high, even among ministers and, and church leaders, that pornography is skyrocketed. Because it's so private and you can do it at any time. If you, ha- you can have it in your hand. And they are gripped. It is a grip that is killing you. This just says if you follow after the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me tell you, you're going to need some supernatural help to get out of that grip. You have got to get that broken off of you. And let me tell you something. When it comes to the light, that's the first step. But it's going to take some bravery. It's going to take laying down of self. It's going to say, I don't want to, I don't want to live that way anymore. It's not working for me. That self-life doesn't work for me. I'm ruling myself and I'm making a mess of my kingdom. Okay, I know I'm stepping. (laughs) Um, You know, when we surrender our throne to the Lord, guess what? When I surrender my throne to the Lord, my eyes are only on Him. I'm not looking at my problems anymore, I'm not looking at my kids and my family, I'm only at His feet fellowshipping with him and being obedient. Because you know what? When he runs my kingdom, he knows exactly what I need to do and when I need to do it. And if I'm walking and looking at him, then I'm accidentally at the right place at the right time every time. It's because he knows. He's in control. Now, does that mean there's times in my life that, that I want to sit back down? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm sitting here now. You know, Craig Rochelle has a saying that, um, and it's the truth, the parts in our lives that we trust God the least or worry about the most, it, it's a signal saying that's where we trust God the least. And we end up having all these little thrones in our life, whether it's our kids, our finances, I mean, you name it, our entertainment, our job, we have all these little thrones in our life that we, we like, we've given him some, but you know, I'm just going to keep a couple of these because I think I can rule pretty good that way. Are you going to keep those? Because he's, he's really good at what he does. 
and, and we're making a mess over here. And I might give all of them but one. I just want to keep this one because this is my kids. I do a pretty good job on my kids. You know, I do. I, me. No, listen. He's so much better than even the best. So we're talking about surrendering these areas in our life. And you're like, I want to surrender. I really, really do, but I don't know how. Well, surrender starts with trust. You know, there's, there's three words that I think are pretty much interchangeable. Surrender, faith, and trust. They're pretty much interchangeable because you're not going to surrender to someone you don't have faith in or trust. I'm not going to surrender my finances to someone who steals if I don't trust them. But I... So surrender comes from trust, from faith. I don't know if you know who Bill Johnson is, um, but he's the pastor at Bethel in Redding, California, and he says something several times that just really hit me because we're a church that is a faith church. I like to call us a faith church. You know what? We have faith. We have faith. I mean, that sounds so great. But what do we have faith in? Well, if you ask the pastors, we're going to say we have faith in God's word, faith in God. Why do we have faith in God's word? Because we trust him. So the saying was, he, he says lots, that um, great faith does not come from striving. You know, sometimes we think if we just do this, if we just say the word of God so many times a day or, or memorize this scripture or whatever, that we've got great faith. You know what? Great faith comes from surrender, not striving. Because great faith is a fellowship with the one who is ruling your life. Great faith says, if he says to do something, I don't understand it. I don't know why, but I'm going to trust. If he gives me a rhema word, which is a word that he tells me for that situation. If you have kids that are lost and he says, I will bring them back. I will bring the prodigal back. Then I'm going to hang on to that word no matter what I see in the natural. If I see my kids out doing things they should not be doing, doing drugs, doing whatever, you know what? I'm going to, every time I see that should be my signal to go, nope. He told me, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you're mighty to save. You are mighty to save. And you are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, and that he's moving when I don't see it, and he can go into that kid's life and move and talk to them when I can't. That's what great faith is. Great faith is surrendering those kids and putting them at his feet and saying, they're yours, tell me what you want me to do. And he says, trust me. And I'll say, absolutely. And then I'll see the situation. Or if it's a bank account and you see the red getting redder and redder and it's not in the black and you're going Okay, I can either dwell on this and I can try to rule and try to figure out how I can get that number back in the black or I can say, Lord, you're the ruler of my life. How do I fix this? And you know what he might say? Start cooking your meals at home. Stop buying coffee every day. And you'll go, okay, Lord, I repent. Now please help me get back in the red or the black. And he will tell you exactly what to do. He will tell you, and he will make a way when a hopeless situation. He can take the hopeless, he can take the less out of it and make it hope. Full, full of hope. Because he, when you turn your eyes on him and you start worshiping him for what he and who he is and what he said he would do in your life, it changes all around you. You know what? Sometimes it changes the way you see. It may not change anything else, but it may change what you see. So great faith starts with surrender. And you can't have surrender unless you know who you're surrendering to. 
And you can't know who you're surrendering to unless you spend time with them. You can't, you, you have to spend time with them to know them. Otherwise, there's no relationship. You're only acquaintance with this Savior that you have. Are you acquainted with him or do you know him? Do you know his character? Do you know that he's faithful to his word? Do you know that when he says something, he does it? Do you know that he loves you? Or do you feel like you're on a performance basis? Do you know how you know him? You read his love letter to you. You know, those ladies in World War II, or now, I suppose, when their husbands off fighting the war or off across the country and they, they just relish an email or a letter and they read it over and over and over because it's a connection between them and their husband. Or the same thing, the men fighting, read a letter from home. This is our love letter. And we have something that the Old Testament never had. The people before Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. Did you know in the Old Testament, very few people heard vo the voice of the Lord? Only a very few handful of people did. They had to go find someone to hear from the Lord, inquire of the Lord through the priests, through the prophets. And there was just a few of them in the land. They had to go find them. But today, we have the Holy Spirit available to us at all times, ready to talk to us. He's ready and willing to walk with us through every single thing. He's ready and willing to say, no, let me help you. Let me help you divert your eyes. Let me help you walk this path. And he will tell you exactly what to do. Um, so, to surrender, you have to trust, and to trust, you have to know. That's, that's the steps you have to do to become a great disciple. One more step to become a great disciple is you have to die. We talked about that self-life. Let's go ahead and turn to Galatians 2.20. This is, I love Galatians 2.20, because this is the scripture that is a great hammer to all those religious rules that we love to keep. You know why some people, I really do like math. Math is one of my favorite subjects. But one of the reasons I like it is because it follows the rules. I mean, it always is the same. If you do this and this and this and this, you always get that. Well, sometimes we bring those, those same cravings into our religious life and see, I just, you know what happens when you have a formula or a set of rules? I mean, does anybody know why C equals pi D? Circumference equals pi. Pi times the di diameter. Does anybody know? Raise your hand if you know. Right. You don't have to know. You don't have to know. It just works. Well, I can tell you why. It's because God's amazing, number one. Pi is 3.14. It's unending. But the diameter of a circle, you can take any circle, any size circle, a little circle, a big circle, any size circle, and you can take the diameter of, of that, like if you had a string, you could go around that one, two, three, and a little bit every single time. That's a formula. But see, you guys didn't know that. You know why? Because it was a formula, and you just plug in the numbers. You plug in the numbers, pi. 3.14 times your diameter, and you got the circumference. Boom. You guys didn't know you were going to learn math today, did you? But see what happens if we have a formula by the way we live? We don't need to know why. If we have a formula, if we just do this, this, and this, this, 
why do I need to fellowship with the one who's ruling my life? If, if I have a formula, I don't need to fellowship with him because I already just plug in the numbers. I check my list. That's why we don't want a formula for our lives. We want a fellowship. It may look on the outside like we have a formula. Oh, she's doing this, this, this. She gets up and reads her Bible. She gets up and prays. Oh, if I get up and read my Bible and pray and then put praise and worship on, my life will go this, 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 this. No, it's a fellowship. It's a fellowship. Okay, back to dying. I forgot I was supposed to die. So, Galatians 2.20 says, my old identity, the old Kim, has been crucified with Christ and no longer lives. Do you know that's why one of the things we do when we get saved is water baptism? Because it symbolizes that that old person you used to be is going under and being crucified with Christ and the new person comes up. That old person, that old Kim's dead. Now, that old Kim tries to come up every now and then and trying to resurrect, but I have to remind her all the time she's dead. Okay? And now, the essence of this new life is no longer mine. I'm not sitting on that throne anymore. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by faith in the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. So when I come up out of that water, it's no longer Kim that lives, but Christ is living through me. That's the goal. I want Christ to live and rule through me. I'm going to go ahead and read 21. It says, so that is why I don't view God's grace as something peripheral. That means just over here. Yeah, God's grace over here. No, it is center. For if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, then, would, then Christ would have died for nothing. No, he... I will never take that for granted. He is going to live through me. Why do we want to surrender? Why do we want him to live through us? I'll tell you why. Because we want to change the world. And we want to change the world because we should tell them the good news. It is good news that you don't have to be enslaved in pornography. It is good news that you don't have to be enslaved to those addiction, addictions anymore. It is good news that he has the answer for those problems that you're walking through right now. It is good news that you don't have to live a self-life anymore. So the fruit, the results of surrendering our thrones and giving them all to God, well, we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? If you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, you have to have the Spirit in you. So let's read the fruit of the Spirit. Well, we did. We've already read the fruit of the flesh. Now the fruit of the Spirit is this, Galatians 5, 23, 22 and 23. But the fruit... Produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. I love that. You know, Pastor Margaret talks about walking in love all the time. We know, we're a church that knows about walking in love. The problem is, is how do we do it? How do we do that? What does it look like? Well, that's where the striving comes. We need to quit striving and realize this is a supernatural work, and it comes through the fruit of the Spirit, and that Kim cannot walk in love without the Spirit giving me the power to do it. Otherwise, all I'm going to do is look and see that, how that person has wronged me. Let me tell you, we don't want to be that way. We don't want to be that way. 
There's a demonic. We talking about the spirit realm? We've got the Holy Spirit working in us. When we yield, we've been talking about unforgiveness and offense. I mean, it is, a, it is an epidemic in the church. When we dwell on that, there's another spirit that takes over. And that other spirit, let me tell you, does not have your best interests at heart. His goal is to destroy you. And he doesn't care how he does it. And if you sit and let that unforgiveness and offense take root and grow, it grows into a spirit of bitterness. And you know what? It always leads to death. Because you then have left the Holy Spirit and you're walking there. Let me tell you a quote. And lots of people have quoted it, so I don't know where it came from. I thought it was Corey Ten Boom, but I've seen lots of other people. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Every time. We can look in our community. Someone... Let sin take over. And you know what? That sin kept them longer than they wanted to stay. And you know what the thing was? The enemy's laughing. Because he destroyed everybody's life. He got what he wanted. The sooner you realize that you are at war the better off you'll be. I said salvation was free, but discipleship cost you everything. And you're like, oh, but I don't want to pay everything. You're going to pay everything. You're going to pay everything to either the creator of the world or the one that wants to destroy you. You do not have a choice to keep anything. You're going to pay everything. Who are you going to pay it to? You think that you are ruling yourself? No. You're not really ruling yourself. Because the end, that's the enemy's goal. That's his number one self, his number one false god is self. And so when you're serving yourself, that self-life that we read about in Galatians, that self-life, the, the, the fruit of the flesh, that, the fruit of the self-life, those things that they crave, every one of them was to destroy you. Every single one of them is made to destroy you. But when we yield ourselves to the discipleship of the Lord and we follow him, yeah, it cost us everything, but his exchange is much better. When I give him my finances, I'm always blessed. When I give him my kids, they walk in the truth. They walk in the truth not because Kim is so great a mother. They walk in the truth because I serve a great God who talks to them when I can't. Yielding to the, the Lord, his lordship over your life, you will never regret. And the results are, this is the result, and I love the way the passion, it's in Ephesians 119. When you walk, when you've, when you've yielded your throne to the Lord, the Most High God, and given him all your thrones in your life, this is what you, you become. It says, I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. Oh, actually, that was 18. Let me do 19. It says, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then this is it. 
then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. You are God's billboard. You're his billboard. I'm tired of walking in the flesh. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to walk in this room and tell you about my God who says, you can lay down your anxiety, that he's the healer of mental health, that the trauma in your life can be healed. I'm telling you, there is nothing too big that it has to bow to the name of Jesus. But there's a cost. You know what? It's going to cost you. To follow Jesus will cost you. It will cost you your dignity. You might have to get out of that chair and come down to the front. You might have to raise your hand. You might have to give up your right to be right. Ooh, ouch. I wrote down a few months ago the things that I surrendered. I have to read this a lot to remind myself, but I want to read it to you. It says, I surrender my right to make them pay, my right to rule my own life, my right to hurt them back, my right to be understood, my right to be honored, to be heard, to be respected, to be accepted, to be loved back, to be thanked. I surrender my right to protect myself. Now I'm talking about to defend myself. No, I didn't do that. You know, that kind of. I surrender my walls, my heart, my life, my mind, my thoughts, my finances, my spare time, my entertainment, and my dignity. You know what? God may bring different things to, to your heart, what you need to surrender. But let me tell you, this is a lifelong project. But it's a walking with him that will always bring you to surrender. But surrender is the beginning of a new life, a much better life. And it's, it's the beginning of a new life. The new Kim gets to live and to be an advertisement and bring the kingdom on Monday and bring the kingdom on Tuesday to everyone I get in contact with. To be that advertisement that says, hey, something's different in me. Do you want it? I've got it. I want to give it to you. Let me help you get those chains off your life because I know the one who can, can break those chains. And when we come in here on Sunday and we wipe off all those wounds and let God heal us and heal us and remember that we are him, his representatives, then we walk out the doors different. And we walk into our jobs on Monday different. And you know what? When we walk into our jobs on Monday different, we're not all of a sudden thinking all the things that are going wrong in our life. All of a sudden, when we let him rule, we know we don't have to worry about that anymore. He's ruling it. All we have to do is listen to his voice. And then all of a sudden, we see that person who's hurting. I've never noticed them before. I'm going to pray for them. They're going to have surgery. I need to pray for them. Let me be the light. That's what we are, little light carriers all around, all around. So go ahead and stand with me, if you don't mind. And Eugene, would you come? Because I believe that every single one of us, God's told us a throne that we've kept back that we're going to rule. I mean, we might have given him a lot, but maybe there's this little area that we're going to rule in this throne. So I just want you to close your eyes. And Eugene and I are going to pray over you. <sighs> Father God, it is not me who compels these people. My eloquence of speech my twisted tongue. Father God, but it's your spirit. It's your spirit that makes the change. So Father, 
I pray that right now we on purpose lay those thrones at your feet. Father, we ask your forgiveness for ruling where we shouldn't have ruled. We say take over. Just like Joshua said, are you for us or against us? Neither. You're here to take over. We give them to you. Take over. Take over our mess. Lord, we've made a mess. We give it to you. Holy Spirit, do your work in this place. Jesus. Father, I thank you. You are the God who exchanges all the less. Yes. When we feel hopeless, you are the one who brings us hope. Because in you, Father, we can be and feel hopeful. Father, I thank you for these people in this room. I thank you, Father God, that you are working in them, that you, Father God, have that connection, or the connection is, is available for each person, Lord, here in this room and those listening online today, Father, that we, that we all, Father, can connect with you in the way that allows you, Father, to make that divine exchange. Yes. To create within us, Lord, a sense of peace, joy, and that those fruits of the Spirit, Lord, those that 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 we that we learn today, the evidence of the Spirit living in our lives, that we can walk full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, faithfulness goodness, and self-control. We thank you that Jesus himself said that it was necessary that he leaves this earth, that he goes to be with you, Father, so that you could send the Comforter, the Great Comforter, the One, the Holy Spirit, to dwell within us, to enable us to walk above when we allow you to be Lord, to be enthroned in our lives. Father, we submit self. We no longer choose, Father, to follow after self, but we make you the ruler of our lives. We could have our, uh, our altar team come to the front. If there has been one thing, potentially, that is the Lord has spoken to your life today, I just want to encourage you to um, make another step. As, as Kim spoke today about the dying to yourself, maybe, maybe it's the thing that you need to do to make that step, to say in Lord, I recognize that I have enthroned myself in this area, and I want you to be the Lord of that area. Now, believe me, believe me, we're all on the same journey. We're making this, we're, we're, we're on this journey of allowing him to be Lord of our lives. And I guarantee you, we all uh, take the throne back from time to time every one of us. So it's a process of allowing him and submitting to him and allowing him to become Lord and, and removing ourselves from that throne and saying, I apologize, I repent. Lord, here is, you can have this throne back. So I'm just going to encourage you that to, to, to uh, as we close today, uh, I want you to feel free and use the, take the opportunity to connect with one of our altar team, uh, Pastor Kim, uh, even Pastor Margaret or myself. We can be here to available to pray with you. Um, and But as we go, I just want to take this opportunity to pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just release these people as they go on their way, Father. And Lord, as they reflect upon this sermon, 
upon the truths that were, that were, that were invested into their lives to God, Father, today. Pray, Lord, that you would in, in, enlighten that area that I guarantee that we all have, that we are not submitting to you. Lord, enlighten that to us, Father, as we go our, on our way. And Father, help us, enable us, work with us, Father, to submit those areas of our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.